You are welcome once again to a wonderful conference that God has given to us. Yesterday night, when we closed with my wife and my children, we went home and sat down and said, wow, word of God. We pray, we, we wish that this could happen every three, three months. Undiluted word of God. We thank God for you that has come. God has used you to come and bless us this much. God bless you in Jesus' name. Today again, we are going to the seminar proper, the conference. God has prepared his servants that we, he will use to bless us. The first, if you go to your program there, the first person that we want to have is Pastor Moses Ojo. The family life of a minister for maximum impact. I would like to call him to the podium to come and teach us again. Please put your hands together as he comes. Clap better, clap better. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Are we in the house? I say praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, what a great opportunity to stand in the presence of our daddies and mommies in this place. It's a very great opportunity. And I ask that God Almighty whom we serve, will not disappoint any one of us in our quest for his kingdom in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Daddy. I thank you, Mommy, for this opportunity. And um, it's my prayer that all that God is using us to do in this place will be fully realized in our lives and ministries in Jesus' name. Thank you. God bless you. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, are we here? Where we came from, we, 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 we talk loud over there. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are here this morning to search the scriptures and to know the things that you have said concerning our lives as ministers and as family people. Lord, I ask that this morning you will break your silence in heaven and you will minister and speak to our understanding in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray everlasting Father that as many of us who are in this business with you but our families have one problem or the other. I ask that this morning as your word will go forth let there be a redemption this morning for our families in the name of Jesus Christ. All that you want us to know so that we will not be guilty before you on the last day. Lord, reveal to your spirit this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, everlasting Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Praise the Lord. As it has been announced unto us. The message before us is the family life of a minister who is aspiring to give a maximum impact in the work of the Lord. Two things are very important in this uh, title here. The family life, the minister, and also we can talk about having maximum impact, effect in the life of others. But I just want to limit myself to the family, family life and the, the minister. Since uh, um, others have spoken about maximum impact and they are still going to talk about it uh, later on. Praise the name of the Lord. So the message is actually about our family lives as ministers of God. And uh, the reason for this is that we have discovered that some of us as ministers, 
we do very well when it comes to ministerial assignment or career. But when we talk about uh, domestic activities, that is what has to do with husband and wife and children at home, uh, most of the time, we have found one thing. We've seen pastors beating their wives Sunday morning before going to climb the pulpit. And then we get to the church and say, thank God, God help me to beat the devil that is troubling my life and is referring to his wife. How can God move in such a church? How can God prove himself? So these are things that God wants to talk to us about this morning. And then we discover also that there are some ministers. All they care for is the congregation, the members of his church. I never have time for the wife. He never have time for the children. They are rotting away at home. He knows how to give counsel unto others in the church. But when the wife is sick, he said, you are the wife of a pastor. Go and do something about it. I don't have time for you. But he has time for others. So all this we want to balance this morning. Because the Bible says, if we are guilty in one, then we'll be guilty in all. We also see in the Bible that there were people that uh, God called and they served God, and they did very well. But when it comes to family matters, there is nothing to write home about. We can easily talk about Eli, who was a priest. We can also talk about Samuel, who was a prophet. We can talk about King David, who was a king. They all did well in their ministerial careers. But when it comes to family life, they were failures. And so if some people could fail, how about you, how about me here today? So that is why God is sending this message unto us this morning so that we don't take care of others and our own home is getting rotten at home. Let's take our text from Titus chapter 1. It's a common passage. Titus chapter 1. We we'll read from verse 6 to 9. Titus chapter 1. From verse 6 to 9. If any be blameless. That's the key word. If any be blameless. And nobody wants to have any blame. Before God. Whether in the church. Or in the home. Or even. At our place of work. If any. Be blameless. The husband of one wife. Look at it there. If any should be blameless, the, the, the meaning of that is that if as ministers and we face God on the day of judgment, if we should be blameless, if we would not be guilty, he said, we as pastors, as children of God, we are only entitled to how many wives now? Only one. Only one. I will offend a lot of people today. Because I'm going to stand on the scriptures. I don't care whether you have two wives. Because that's an offense already. You are already abusing the plan of God for your life. And God knows that one woman is able to satisfy, satisfy the quest of a man. Not two. Not three. For other religions, they can have four wives. That's their own business. I am not addressing them. I am not talking to them. But for those of us who are here, the message is for us. If any, if any, bishop, fine, and bishop, if any will be blameless before God Almighty, the Bible says, we are only entitled to only one wife. Only one. The other time, a pastor where I came from, that's Ibadan now, a pastor had two wives and he ordained them as pastors. Double anointing, we call it, isn't it? The question is, do they have a copy of this Bible in their hands? He married 
two wives and he ordained both of them. You know, this old person is here now and I'm preaching like this. Do you think we receive my message? That is why I said I will be offending many people. And who cares? Who cares? There was a time I regretted a particular thing that I did. That time I was pastoring at the University of Ibadan. And there was this lecturer. He had a problem with his wife. And uh, he came. I counseled. We prayed together. But there were many things that he covered up. That when I slept, God revealed. So the following Sunday I called him and I asked, this, 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 and he confirmed. And he said, they were true. But there was something that God said I should tell him, but I was afraid because I was very young then. That was the uh, early 90s, when I was just coming up. I was afraid to deliver that message, and I know what I suffered from God. That's why I said, since then I have repented. Any message you ask me to go and preach, I don't care. We have only one life to live. And we must live it well for God. Otherwise, no matter how long we live here on earth, we are going to pass on one day. And it's not that passing on that matters, but where we are going to spend eternity. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's go back to our test. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife. Not only that, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. We have a lot to say in this place. Having faithful children. Some years ago, there was this man of God, a Cameroonian. He was an Anglican priest. He had only one son. And he wanted that son to become a missionary. And this child said, no, I want to be a, a medical doctor. So I don't want to be a missionary, I don't want to be a pastor. And do you know that this priest came to the church and tendered resignation letter? Why? Because he had no control over his son. Son, you will be a missionary. And so said, no. My aspiration in life is to become a medical doctor. He came and said, how many of us will do that? That man followed the Bible. No Pentecostal now. He followed the Bible. He came and said a letter and said, I am not fit. If I cannot take care of my own immediate family, of course, you should know that your wife and your children, they are your first church. Am I right now? Yes. Yes. You start from there. If you have no control over your family, your wife is abusing you, even when you are preaching in the church. He is laughing at you, saying, what are bro saying today? All he can call you is bro. Because you say you have no integrity. Before your wife, you know what to do secretly. And then you are afraid that one day this woman will blow up. Because of that, you have become a doormat before her. This man tender her his resignation letter. Where are they? There are some of us now. Our children are there in the prison. And here we are still holding on to the pupils. Our children now, maybe we send them to counselors. Help me counsel my son. Help me counsel my daughter. Help me do this. Help me do that. For that man, the child has not gone to that extent. And yet, he tendered his resignation letter. He said, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or ruling. For a bishop must be blameless. Is he only bishop now? Is he only bishop that will go to heaven? So if you ask me, for a Christian brother, a Christian sister, must be what? Is it because people will read and say, 
he's only talking to the bishop. Thank God I'm not a bishop. Even if you are qualified to be a bishop, say because of this very verse. I don't want to be a bishop. It's not only bishop. Every one of us, we have been addressed. We have been addressed. The other time somebody was asking a question. For me, I can drink. And if I drink, no problem. Uh, eat do the Baptist like. Eat the mother like. Don't let them drink. That is John the Baptist. Is it not the same kingdom that John the Baptist went? That we too were aspiring to go? Yesterday we were told here that God is not a partial God. He is the same standard. Am I talking now? He is the same standard for every one of us. So you are not allowed. I am not allowed. A pastor got drunk. Saturday morning, and it was to conduct wedding. That very Saturday morning, ushers have to guide him like this to the altar. And when he got there, he said, Don't worry, today you will carry God. Is that what God asked us to do now? Eventually, he fell down there on the pulpit. He fell down. In our own contemporary time, all these things are happening. Let it happen in the Old Testament. God will not spare. Immediately. Immediately. God will smite. So, for a bishop of a servant now, must be blameless as a steward of God. Not self-willed, not soon angry, not giving to wine, no striker, not giving to filthy local, but a lover of hospitality. A lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Praise the name of the Lord. I say praise the name of the Lord. Ministers are representative of God. We should know that we are not representing ourselves. And it is God who has chosen us. We have not chosen ourselves and we have not appointed ourselves. Our pastor who led us yesterday told us. And in fact, I want to add. In my former church over there, there was this brother. That was just posted. Uh, you can go there and take care of this branch of the ministry. And for years, that church remained the same. And any time there is a, a meeting with the general overseer, and he said, how many were you last month? How many are you now this month? He is always the same figure. And one day the GS now said, ah, what is the matter with you? I, it's you that appointed me. God didn't call me. If you want to take your church, take your church now. We were there and all of us were laughing. You see? It's as if you want to be begging him, please continue, continue. Whether you are making it or not. If that brother was sincere. He was sincere. You are the one who appointed me. I never had the call of God. And if you do not hear the call of God, how will God lead you? How will God direct you? How will God bless the work of your hand? These are the errors in the ministries. So, quickly let's look at the message from three perspectives. Number one, we want to see who is a minister. Who is a minister? Then number two, we shall look at his calling and ministry. His calling and ministry. And then number three, we look at his family life, which is the main. The main. So I'll be brief in the first two, so that I spend a little time on the last one. Who is a minister? 
Because we are looking at the family life of a minister. Let's look at 1 Timothy. Chapter 1 from verse 12. Are you following me please? Answer me now. Thank you very much. 1 Timothy chapter 1 from verse 12 to 16. Let's open our Bible so that we can all read together. Please, can you, this one is disturbing me here. 1 Timothy chapter 1 from verse 12. It says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who had enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. He counted me faithful. Look at the word there. He did not say, he found me faithful. He counted me faithful. Putting me into the ministry. Which means, it's now left for you to do what? To prove. Because he said, he counted me faithful. Putting me into the ministry. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor? And injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 15 now. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Albeit, for this cause I obtained mercy. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them we should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Praise the name of the Lord. Let me quickly add this before I say what I want to say in Deuteronomy. I have a reason for doing this now. Deuteronomy chapter 32, in verse 12. I want to add this before I... Deuteronomy 32 verse 12 says, So, the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. Who is this place talking about? Moses. Moses. He said, So the Lord alone lead, did lead him, and there was no juju in his pocket. There was no straight God with him. No evil power. The person that is called of God, or who says he's called of God, and he still has some tears, and he still has to go and do something before, you know, that we bury under the altar. You are not a child of God. Talk less of being a minister. And it is so common today. Very, very. How many are we going to see? Somebody will build a big cathedral under one month. The whole place is filled up. No evangelism. How come? The people that you use you do to call to the church Will they not give you a problem? That's number one. Because the Spirit of God is not going to be there. Though the Bible will be there, preaching the word of God, but you know it. There's something underneath. If God does not call you, it is better you resign now. Resign. And of course, I will tell you why people are now enrolling him, themselves in the work of the ministry. It's either they have failed in the secular world. Let me go and try my luck out there. That's why the church is full of lazy people now and this. Lazy people. They have failed in the work. Let me stay there and they use apostolic authority. I was telling our daddies and mommies in my class yesterday. When a taxi driver exposed 
a minister of God. This minister has budgeted that taxi and he was going to have a special program. He has invited the guest minister. While he was inside the taxi, he brought out his phone and he was calling the guest minister. Guess what he told him? He said, please, you will raise money for me. That is why I'm inviting you. I don't see anything wrong with that anyway. He said, but as you stand on your the altar like this, look at the right hand side. You will see a man with gray hair, just like myself now. He always sit by the right hand side of the altar. The moment you finish, walk down to him. And tell him that the spirit of God says, you should buy land for your pastor. And build a house for him. The spirit of God says so. The taxi man had all these things. So, there was now a radio program. And this man now called and said, Sir, which church now are we supposed to be going to? Look at what happened in my car. How a pastor called and said, Tell that man that it is God. It is the Lord. Maybe we are forgotten. Even if we abuse Jesus. Even if we match him on the ground. There is forgiveness. Isn't it? But for the Holy Spirit. What did the Bible say? There is no what? All the lies that we are telling. As I am standing here now. The Spirit of God says. This and that. Look, you are going to answer for all these things. You are going to. Because you are carrying the error. The message that God didn't send you. Because you want to be popular. So, who is a minister of God? Is that person that is called by God to do the things of God whose reward is from God? The person that is called by God himself, you will hear it. Not somebody now telling you that the way I'm looking at you is as if God wants to use you. That's not the issue. That's not the issue. You yourself, you must hear. If you want to get confirmation, that is another thing. It's allowed. It's allowed. Let's look at what Paul the Apostle said. In um, Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. We read from verses 15 and 16. Galatians 1, 15 and 16. He said, but when it pleases God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred none with flesh and blood. I did not go and be asking, look at me. Do I look like the person that God is calling now? Can God use me? And you know the Bible says that Paul was a very shorty somebody. He said his bodily, his body was very weak. He said, but his letter very powerful. Let him write you a letter. You will know he's a lawyer. He said, when God called me, I did not go about and keep on asking. That's what he means by when I did not confer with flesh and blood. I did not go to any human being. I had it myself. That confirmation is very, very important. That assurance that God is calling you because you are going to meet so many things on the way. Look at Moses. Can somebody say that God didn't call him? He had it. Look at all the problems. For me, I used to think that if this is the will of God, and then he comes and says, Moses, rise up, take the children of Israel and lead them to, I mean, lead them from Egypt to Canaan land. For me, I don't think that it's just to pick microphone. I say, God has spoken. Let's rise, let us go. Then I take my suit and I hang it. Everybody follow me. Was it like that? It's not the call of God. Look at all that he suffered on the way. He was sure of 
of his calling and he knew what he was coming to do. Yet, look at all the obstacles. Look at all the barriers. Look at all the hindrances. So, you that you have the calling of God, expect all this. Expect all this. The enemy will not just open his eyes and, uh, you know, say, right, uh, you can go. And then you win the whole city, you win the whole country, you win the whole world. They won't allow you. They, they, they have their kingdom as well. And you know, as ministers of God, we are trying to snatch souls from hell. They are already there. You think they will release them anyhow? In our class there yesterday, I was talking to our leaders, I said... And uh, in a from, uh, I think it was last month, when God opened my eyes and I saw this thing that they said we pray to the point where the enemy will give up a surrender. We will begin to labor. And that labor is only God that can tell. Since the day that God opened my eyes that only one plague is not enough for Pharaoh to release the people of Israel. One plague is not enough. Not two, not three, until ten. So how many plagues have we released against the, the enemies who are keeping down the source? Maybe two, two plagues in some churches. Maybe three, maybe four. But I want to say that if God used ten plagues before Pharaoh can release, then we need nothing less. We need nothing less. So it's not just an easy thing that I'm a minister, I am this, I am that. You will face many things. So now, let's quickly. Uh, a minister must be born again. He must be sanctified. He must be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, when we say he must be sanctified, I'm sure we know the meaning of sanctification. The uprooting of Adamic nature in man. And it's the second work of grace. If you are not sanctified, the people will get you angry. That was the problem that Moses had. And you see, our senior pastor was hammering on anger, anger, anger yesterday. If you are not sanctified, it could be that even the person you are praying for in your church is the one who will be going about backbiting you. And if you get to hear it, you and your wife, you, you just finish fasting a prayer for this person. And is the one going about spoiling your church and spoiling your name and spoiling your family and your ministry. How will it be easy to forgive if you are not sanctified? So, we need it. Because Satan will send people to come and provoke you in the ministry. So, you must possess the attributes of God. And what is, are these attributes? Talk about love, forgiveness, holiness, faithfulness, Humility, etc., etc. He must be disciplined. A minister of God must be disciplined in every area now. But just let me talk on the area of money. Some of us are not disciplined when it comes to the issue of money. Sunday service, you don't care about the attendance. How many people came last Sunday? How many people are here today? That's not your business. Is that not so? Is that not it? Is that not it? Bring, 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 bring. That's it. He said, Madame wants to buy shoe. Say me as the head of Say my wife will not buy shoe. Ni. When you now say, Madame wants to buy this, bring uh, 30,000. He too will pocket some 10,000. You will have a wife, have a wife too. We are the one teaching them. We are not disciplined in the area of money. I have about sex. Sorry, I have to talk about that one too. You as the pastor, you are the one that declares seven days fasting and prayer. 
And we are starting on Monday. Now, Monday come now. Madam, how now? Uh -uh. Are you not the one who said uh, we should fast? You meet this one to be inside of it again? No discipline. A time of fasting, is it a time of pleasure? To be sleeping with your wife and uh, having fun again. That means you are not serious. We call that one hunger strike. It's not fasting. Not. God doesn't answer that one. Go to Israel. They will remove everything and pour ashes. Is it it? Upon themselves to say that God we are nothing before you. So is it a time now to go near your wife? And the woman is saying, ah, Daddy, wait now. Is it not just seven days? See, that one doesn't reach this one. Who told you it doesn't reach that one? It reached there. Yeah? You have to wait. That one is indiscipline. Only those two I will mention under that one. He must be a man of conscience. A man of conscience. Before others will judge you, you judge yourself. He must be accessible to the members of the church. You cannot build empire around you. People want to come and see you as their leader. They are afraid. They are afraid. And they have been doing booking now for the past three months. They cannot get to you. You must be accessible. Let your door be open. That is why you are there. The woman with the issue of blood. He to say just cry, build empire around you. Know, but he will not get there and touch the hem of his garment. He must be a man of vision. He must be bold. He must be a man of prayer. He must be a man of faith. And he must be aware of prodigal spirit. Spend it anyhow. Now when we talk about his calling, that's point number two now. Of course, it's calling a ministry. We are still talking about ministers calling a ministry. Let's write down all Ephesians 4, 11 to 12. You know it there, the five-fold ministry. Jeremiah 3, 15. God said, I will give you a pastor according to what? To my own heart. I will give you a pastor according to my own heart. So see yourself as a representative. When it is time to counsel, give a proper counsel. Our brother told us yesterday, some of us, we don't read. We don't read. See? It's a problem. It is what you read that the Holy Spirit will remind you of. Am I right now? Yes. You know, sometimes you just, ah, this verse of the scripture, you will just be, the Holy Spirit will now remind you, this is where you can find it. You don't just read Bible because you have someone to preach. You yourself, you need it. Read it for yourself. It's not, today is Bible study. Uh, bring Bible. Uh, today is Sunday morning. You do for the congregation, but nothing for yourself. You'll be dying. So, the minister of God must be sure of his calling, not self-appointed, not a failure in the secular world. He is not an entertainer. Neither is he a comedian. You see what we have turned the pupils to today? People are dying and God has chosen us to go and rescue them. We know what we practice on the pupit here. We are not comedians. We are called to come and declare the word of God. Look at it there in Malachi. It's what you know, but let's say Malachi chapter, chapter 2 verse 7. Malachi chapter 2 verse 7 says, For the priest lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth. 
For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Praise the name of the Lord. He is the messenger of God. We are not entertainers. When last did you preach and people begin to shed tears? Are you not making them happy? In my church, I don't be drum. I'm not saying it's a sin. It's not a sin. Most people in your church ask them, why are they coming? Is it because of the word of God? Is it because of the knowledge that they are receiving? Or they just come when it is music time. They begin to dance up and down. Nothing like that. If you come, we know it is because of the word of God. And if they are not ready, they will leave. And uh, l- l- let me tell you something. A man of God said that as a minister of God, even if you are not able to take others to heaven and you succeed to take your wife and your children, he said you have done enough. And if you as a minister, you are able to take them there. And I also, I take them there. Who else will be left? And of course, if you if you take care of others outside and inside your own home, you know you are not you are not the right person. And the wife has been complaining, and children are complaining. But you you you, you know how to to have outside outside acceptance. That you are good outside. But inside, Madame knows that you are not good, you are not, you are not, you are not a man of God. And that is why, if you want to confirm with a man of God, go to the wife, go to the children, find out from them. are talking about maximum impact. If we should ask ourselves, now since we became ministers of the gospel in this land, in this land now, you know, we, we, we came to meet you here. And so let us talk about this place. And I am also there. Not that I'm excluding myself. We were told that somebody went somewhere as a minister of the gospel to go and preach. He preached in that place and he left. And every person in that particular place became born again. All those selling alcohol, selling cigarettes, all these things, they close up. A century, 100 years later, some people came to that place and discovered that you can't find cigarette to buy here. You can't find a, 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 a hot drink to buy here. But the neighboring towns and villages they are available. What happened? They said, oh, a man of God came 100 years ago and he preached in this land. That is what I know as maximum impact. Maximum impact. So what impact are we having now? Even in the congregation where God put us. Or in the environment where we live. What impact? Because these are the things that God is going to ask us. It's better we keep on asking ourselves now. What impact? Are we just there collecting money from the people? And we just say, okay, let's go and hold a crusade. Let's go and do program. Let's just, what is the outcome? What is the goal? Our pastor told us here yesterday. You don't just do things because you see others doing it. Otherwise, you'll be running on somebody else's lane. And nobody can run in another person's lane and expect to make it. It's not possible. 
So. The ministry that we are given that we are called into. Number one is to preach the gospel of Christ. Not any other thing. To preach, the, if you know you cannot preach, go back to school and learn this Bible. Because if you teach error, you yourself, you are not far from a, a sinner. You should know where to stop. What you don't know. So that you don't mislead others. Even in counseling. As a real man of God. You know when you are talking sense. When the spirit is still there leading you. You know it. The moment the spirit departs. You should know also. Because all that that you will be saying will be rubbish. That one does not carry weight anymore. Tell the person to go that you are finished. So our ministry is to preach the gospel of Christ. To get sinners saved or converted unto Christ. To warn sinners of the impending doom. To stabilize the believers in the faith. To give counsel and pray for the brethren. To teach sound doctrine. When we talk about sound doctrine, salvation is there. Sanctification is there. Restitution is there. The second coming of Christ is there. Great white throne judgment. Where everybody will stand at last. To receive whatever we have done. Whether for good or for evil. The doctrines of heaven. The doctrines of hell. The doctrines of rapture. They are all there. Do we have time for all these things? No. It is prosperity. Seven steps to prosperity. We don't have time anymore. We just want to make the people happy. Inside sin. Sin. So, we are to lead believers to God's kingdom. Now I'll go to the last point, which is the family life now. I don't know when I'm supposed to stop, please. Where is our moderator? Sir, sorry, sir. When? Pardon? I have five minutes more. I will talk on this one. No. Honestly, that is why we are here. All right, sir. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry, I did not even look at the time. When I started, I'm sorry. Uh, his family life now. Okay, let me just rush through too. Uh, of course, we know that when we talk about family, it starts with husband and wife. Am I right now? If you read the book of Genesis, the Bible says, after God has done one thing, he will look. He said, this one is good. When we do this, he will look, say, this one is good. But when it comes to the issue of husband and wife, he said, it is not good that man should be alone. That's where it starts from. It is not good that man should be alone. So if you are a man, you are not married, you are not fulfilling God's word in your life. Oh. Man, I call it man, not boy now. If you are a man, or maybe you are even a pastor. In fact, people who are not married, who are not married, are not supposed to be pastors. Honestly. Honestly. You see, because some women, they don't know how to talk. If you are there as a pastor and no wife, and uh, one of your members come to you and say, Daddy, pray for me. Oh. My menstruation supposed to stop three days ago. This is 10 days now. What do you understand? If you have a wife, say, go and meet madam. So, full stop. Because that's how you will enter into it now. Before you know it, you know the story. So, that is why it is good that you must have your wife. Then you know your boundary. You 
know your life. Anything that has to do with women, go and meet mommy. That's why mommy is there for you. So, and of course, if we go to Ephesians 5 22 to 25, we all know it. We preach all these messages. I just want to talk about two things there. He said, Women should do what? They should submit to their husbands. Look at it very well. Women should submit. But when it comes to men, say men love. He didn't tell the woman, woman love. Why do you think God, or you think it's an error? That God did not say, women love your husband. He said, no. Women submit. And when we actually talk about submission here, it's not that you are forcing her that you should know that I am your boss, I am your head. I visited a family one day, a lecturer at UI. Good friend. And there was this little argument. And the man said, you know, pastor is here now. And pastor has always told us that men, that we are the head. And the woman said, yes. I'm not contesting that one. You are the head. But I am the neck. And without the neck, the head cannot stay. So how do I judge that one? <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. Everybody has this ego, whether as a woman or as a man. You know. So, what I'm saying here is that God said, woman, respect, honor, and submit. And I said, you don't need to force that woman. When we talk about submission, submission under that context is the type of love or the type of obedience that is motivated by love. That's the way I see submission. It's not that you are being forced to respect me, to honor me. You know it. So submission here to me, it is an obedience that is motivated by love. Is you. That is why you see that Sarah can call the husband. What's the name? Lord, thank you very much. But today, what do we see? The day my daughter came home with the husband, they say, But they go and greet that dinner. I say, Who is Buddy? Your husband. Go and greet that dinner. They don't let me hear that too. Follow Bible. We didn't see where Sarah said, Abraham, well, do I bring water for you now? My Lord, my King, who will not be happy? Your head will swell, isn't it? So women don't know how to get money from their husband. Who will say that now and I will not put hand in my pocket and say, Mommy, whatever you want. They don't know. They'll be committed pastor. My husband is not caring. You are the cause. You are the cause. So he said, woman, submit. But for the husband, he said, love. Why? If your wife doesn't love you, will she marry you? If your wife doesn't love you, will she leave her parents' house? If your husband doesn't love you, will, will she get to see her maiden name and throw away her father's name and now come and be bearing your name and say, I'm now Mrs. Your own name. So when God says, Submit. I didn't put love. You know that all this one has been taken care of. The love is there. We have seen cases where the woman comes from a very rich family. You just enter into a bedroom, put on tap, water, everything. But the husband that is married to, they are only pulling water from, uh, what do you call it? From where? And she's bearing with you. Is that not love? We see that if we actually practice what we are asked to do, we will not have problem in our marriage. And let me say this also. In Luke, let's read it. Luke 16 verse 18. This is where we offend a lot of people now. Of course, those who are not following the scriptures me. Luke 16 18. It says, Whosoever put away his wife, 
and married another. Committed what? They say it out loud now. That's why we are here today. You see? All the other one I have said, they are just, they are not, they are just, just to add salt to soup, to add maggi. This is the real thing. So he says, whosoever put it away his wife and married another, committed adultery. And whosoever married her that is put away from her husband, committed adultery. And where will adulterers end, brethren? Hellfire! They see all this, but they are careless about it. We are seeing situations now where pastor, so called pastor, the real legitimate wife, the one that they married, that they paid their diary, they send them away. And they go and be looking for the one that has evil spirit. Or banjay spirit. Familiar spirit. To come and be using that spirit to be doing what? To be seeing vision in the church. And when brethren come, he say, go and meet mommy. That's, that's, that's a field. Go and meet mommy. Using juju power, evil power, marine power. Bro, why are you divorcing? I say, well, I didn't know God will call me. Now that God has called me, so we are incompatible. She didn't go to school. She cannot teach Sunday school. She cannot sing in the choir. God is calling you to come and save souls. Is your wife not among them? That you send her away to go and die and perish? That is why we believe in restitution. Abraham did it. When he used a carnal method, he getting a child. And the wife said, no. Send this woman away. He is the same woman who gave careless advice. Isn't it? Come and sleep with her. Since I cannot, so that your ministry or the word of God that God said concerning you will not be destroyed. So I will not be the hindrance. Sleep with this one and raise a child. After that, she came back again. Send her away. Until God had to address Abraham, listen to her. You know, he didn't have problems sleeping with the lady. Sending her away now became problem. That God, I mean, it took God's uh, intervention. Before he sent her away. That is restitution. If you are married to two, three wives, go and do restitution. Of course, they will not tell us. We only see uh, Mama Tolu with her, with him in the church. The other one is in the village. The other one is in Abuja. There was a pastor who left Oshun State here. And he came to Oyo State. That's why. If somebody is uh, maybe on transfer or whatever, and uh, he's going to another place, please give him a letter or give her a letter. Or oh, somebody is coming from, I have this and that. Where is the letter from where you are coming from? We should be able to do that now. He divorced his wife with three children and he ran away. Only to get there and say, they gave him a church. No, they didn't find out anything. Until that woman kept on praying. Kept on praying. And one day, she got a message that this is where the man is. And he came with the photograph of the marriage photograph and everything. And he presented before the pastor that he met there, sir. Already, he has hooked one of the choir sisters. I will, before I round up, I will talk to all those of us who are not yet married. Are you getting my point? There will be time. Because the, the, the house of God now has become a temple prostitute. Prostitutes are there and hoping to get one cent to marry one day. The same thing with the brothers who 
They are also temple arm robbers. Also looking for sisters to hook. See? When they now call the pastor, come and identify. Who is this one? He said, Pastor, yes, she used to be my wife. And I will prefer to go to hell rather than to take her back. Now, we church with that one now, Pastor. The one who pronounced upon himself that he preferred to go to hell than to take her back. So, Now, let me quickly just round up now. You know Joshua now, 24, verses 14 and 15. He said, as for me and my house, isn't it? Ah, yes. We must commend that man. He saw the wife and the children as companions in the business. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord for you. I don't care whatever happens to you. Some of us are here now as pastors and our wife, they are at, uh, what's the name of any market around here? Uh -huh. Where they are selling fish. The mom must work. Look at my daddy and my mommy here. Are we not happy seeing people like this? The rest of us, where are we, are we not married? Where is madame? Is that is where to start from. Everything you are receiving now, she didn't hear. And then you'll be using your own level to judge her. Whether you are the one that put her in the market to go and be selling. He said, I will give her information. Which information are you going to give? And you will not buy the case right now to go and give to her to hear. She will not complain your, 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 your effort. Why you are building? Let me, I just remember this one now. This one is the case is the court now. A pastor got married very well. But now, what's the problem? He said, anytime I sleep with her, my anointing always go down. Because of that, pastor has gone to court. In Ibadondia. To divorce her. He said, anytime he goes to Martin to go and pray and carry her anointing, her, the moment he sleep on her, he said, everything will just be deflated. Where were you before? When you were marrying her? When I was doing my program at the university and I happened to go to a particular court and you know for my I met a pastor there with his wife standing before the unbeliever. This pastor also dragged the wife there and said I'm not going to marry her because he always fight and drive away my, uh, the members from the church. And when the woman will climb the box, he said, don't mind it. The thing is that a young woman just came from abroad. Who bought a Jeep? Is it Jeep car now? What do you call it? For him. That is that lady that he wants to marry. That is why he's doing this. I was crying where I sat down. That place that we read in Luke 16, 18. I called both of them out when we finished. I talk and talk and talk. That brother will not listen. I don't know him before. I collected their uh, you know, phone number. Till today, the woman will pick, but the man will not pick. Of course, what do you expect the court to do? The court has granted divorce. They have parted ways now. How many are we going to see? Which heaven are they going to now? Can't, don't they have a copy of this Bible and know what the Bible says? That there is no, you know, divorce and remarriage. That if you do it, it is adultery and you go to hell. They know it. Just like our father and the Lord said there yesterday. The Bible says, can somebody hold fire in his bosom and not be burnt? Abi, the book of uh, Proverbs. You know this thing is fire. And you are still, that's, that's the biggest fool. Just like our pastor said yesterday. So, as I ran up, the pastor now, the man of God, must love his wife, must have control over his children, 
He must spend quality time with his family. Let me tell us this. Whenever you are having a special program, whatever you and your wife and children in the city room, and visitors call me, what do you do? Madam, get her, get her. Don't you see that Sister Dupe has come in? I want to cancel her now. And you change your way, wait your wife as if, as if she's a goat. Don't you know that you are disgracing her? It is the way that you hold your wife, that your church. We also do what? Uh -uh. If you treat her as dormant, they will pass her like this. They will not say good morning, mommy. It is you. When you are preaching, you are using family issues on the altar. What happened between you and your wife? You bring it to the altar and you are downgrading that woman. Nobody will respect her in the church. So, he must spend quality time. He must provide for the family. He must balance the ministerial work with domestic activities. I read a book that somebody wrote. And in the acknowledgement, he said, I thank God for my wife. She is a woman that has known loneliness. No, because the work of the ministry will take him out. She's always alone with the children. He is not the best. He is not the best. I am telling you. To so just leave that woman alone because she'll be regretting. Why did I marry a pastor? So. There must be blending. He must not disgrace his wife. He must demonstrate transparency. He must maintain constant family altar. His family, his family comes first before the congregation. I told us when I started that there are people who were before us. They did not balance their activities. I mentioned three of them like that as I ran up now. Who was the first person I mentioned? A lie, a priest. Can you imagine? A priest. And who was somewhere? A prophet, isn't it? David, a king. Can you imagine? Priest, prophet, king. All of them, they succeeded in their ministerial career. But when it comes to family issue, we all know what happened. Eli, he heard all that the children were doing, standing by the entrance of the church, collecting money from people and so on. Samuel, when he died and he was going, I mean, when he was going to die to put his children there, you know the problem. They said, no, give us a king instead because they take bride. David also, you know what happened to his children. So if all those ones happen, how about us today? Let's rise up and let us pray.